we're back with another episode of Inner Earth Conspiracies. And today we have two very different accounts of Inner Earth, but both tied to the idea of Inner Earth abductions, with plenty of mystery, madness, and subterranean lore that will make you wonder, could these conspiracy theories of an ancient advanced world beneath the surface of the Earth actually be true? First up is a manuscript describing a portal to Inner Earth in Kentucky with connections to a major secret society and an unsolved disappearance in the 1800s. And second, a pulp fiction magazine in the 1940s who claimed their inner earth stories were actually based on fact, and hundreds of witnesses came forward to confirm this reality. Hey fellow seekers, welcome. I'm Mr. Mythos. If you're a fan of strange and ancient mysteries with research so deep you're guaranteed to fall down the rabbit hole, you're in the right place. I humbly ask that you give this video a like and ding the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the rare info we'll be digging into every Saturday. And if you love it, please share this series with a friend. We'll begin with our first mystery, a book as infamous today as it was when it was first published over a hundred years ago, Edidorpa, or The End of the Earth. Edidorpa is a uniquely scientific account of Inner Earth presented as at least somewhat based on fact by its author John Uri Lloyd, an American chemist and pharmaceutical manufacturer. It was published in 1895, and the full title of the book is Edidorpa, or The End of the Earth, The Strange History of a Mysterious Being and the Account of a Remarkable Journey. Yes, it's quite a mouthful, but it accurately reflects the contents within. From its first pages, the book insists that it's the result of a manuscript delivered by a mysterious being known only as I Am The Man Who Did It. I Am The Man was supposedly kidnapped 30 years earlier, during the early 1800s by a secret society that he threatened to expose. The following events that he recounts may seem fantastical, but there are some very real connections that we'll be going over after this brief summary that will make you question the reality of this 126-year-old text. According to the book, his hooded abductors took him to a remote cave in northern Kentucky, where he was then presented to an eyeless, sexless reptilian cave dweller whose face was, quote, wet and water dripped from all parts of his slippery person. The moisture seemed to ooze as from the hide of a water lizard." End quote. This reptilian then leads I Am The Man into the cave as his only guide on a physics-bending, psychedelic subterranean journey, and what follows are hundreds of pages of mostly scientific recordings as he moves ever deeper into the earth. Underground, they travel through forests of colossal fungi, and he encounters inner earth beings such as a race of little people with giant hands, as well as an angel-like inner earth deity who presents itself to him in the form of an intoxicatingly beautiful woman, boasting that, quote, the universe bows to my authority. Stars and suns enamored pulsate and throb in space and kiss each other in waves of light. Atoms cold embrace and cling together, end quote. This deity gives its name as Edidorpa, which is a backward spelling of Aphrodite, the ancient Greek goddess of love, lust, beauty, and pleasure. And this is where the book gets its title. Perhaps the most profound section of Edidorpa is when I Am The Man eats from the colossal fungi and undergoes a psychedelic trip. He hallucinates himself being burned and frozen to death continuously, as time stands still, until he finally witnesses heaven at the center of the earth. In this overwhelming moment, which can probably be described as death of the ego, he realizes that mankind's science is severely flawed and that science and religion are, in fact, one and the same. With these ancient secrets of life and the universe known only to the few elite and carefully guarded within this subterranean world. After this long journey that he was forced to take, I am the man ends up as no longer a man, but some sort of transcended immortal, fulfilling the promise given to him by his occultist abductors. Quote, you should expect bodily destruction. 
inner earth will annihilate you as a mortal being, and yet you will exist, suspended between life and death." End quote. Despite the mainstream view of Edadorpa as one of the first science fiction novels, when it was first published, this book was, in fact, presented as non-fiction. And I'll show you proof of that in a minute, but first, let's discuss the utter strangeness of the contents themselves. Anyone who reads Edadorpa should notice almost immediately that it isn't action-packed with twists and turns, but rather overwhelmingly scientific, with long sections dedicated to discussing chemical reactions, geological phenomena, and the inner earth physics of energy, gravity, light, and motion. And all of these are given in such detail to the reader that these seemingly magical scenarios enter the realm of plain natural science. For example, toward the end of the book, I am the man and his reptilian guide jump off a 6,000 mile deep crevice, and for seven entire chapters, the gravitational physics of inner earth are explained in painstaking detail until they finally reach the bottom, alive, thanks to the gravitational difference so deep within the earth. It's challenging to debunk what's written, and perhaps that's why the book became so popular years after it was published, with passionate fans even naming their baby girls at Adorpa. Even in the scientific community, there was a shocking amount of respect for this strange book. For example, the author John Uri Lloyd would receive many letters from professors of physics and geology stating their interest in the book and asking him plainly about the nature of it, whether it was fiction or real. In one response, Lloyd wrote the following, quote, Dear Professor Buck, please accept my thanks for your very kind letter. In bringing this book before the public, I bring to myself care and troubles that you cannot foresee, and that I appreciate highly your words of encouragement. It matters little who recorded the words, nothing at all. The question that concerns me is, have I done my part creditably? Some of us come into the world to teach, we cannot evade our destiny. Whether we teach from our own selves or from others is of no moment. The important point is whether we teach properly. Will the result of our instruction tend to elevate the thought of others, and thus lead to the truth? Edadorpa is not an idle creation. The mission of this book is unseen by most of its readers, and it pains me to appreciate the fact that, to some, the beauties of the work will serve but to deepen their hatred of conceptions holy and sublime. Very sincerely yours, John Uri Lloyd." End quote. So who exactly was this John Uri Lloyd, who claimed to be fulfilling his destiny by publishing Edadorpa, despite the backlash he expected it would bring? I already mentioned that Lloyd was an accomplished and influential pharmaceutical manufacturer, but his story begins in 1849, when he was born in the Finger Lakes region of New York. Lloyd left school at 14 in order to sweep the floors in a pharmacy where, after his work, he would study books on chemistry and medicine. During the Civil War, this young prodigy moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, where he took all the money he saved to open a pharmaceutical factory downtown, which became so successful that the author Mark Twain was his frequent dinner companion, the U.S. President Grover Cleveland was his weekend fishing buddy and the Smithsonian Institution commissioned him for major scientific surveys. Today, John Uri Lloyd's ultimate legacy is his world-renowned research library, the Lloyd Library and Museum, which is considered one of the treasures of Cincinnati. By all accounts, this man was incredibly accomplished, respected, and well-connected, the same man who claimed to be leading the world to the truth with Edadorpa a book which he published but insisted he wasn't the author, thus shocking the world. A medical journal noted that, quote, Indeed, the sudden introduction of the side of his study has astonished his most intimate friends, end quote. The mystery of Edadorpa only truly begins once you understand who did write it. And apparently this wasn't John Uri Lloyd, but the white-bearded and transcendent immortal, 
I am the man, who manifested in the home of a close colleague of Lloyd's, an occultist named Llewellyn Drury. Llewellyn Drury was an ambitious immigrant who came to Cincinnati in the 1850s to work with a large manufacturing firm, but Outside of his work, Drury built up a large library of occult literature in his apartment near St. Peter in Chains Cathedral. John Uri Lloyd writes that seven years prior, Llewellyn Drury asked for his assistance in publishing the manuscript of Edadorpa. Now, before we move on, I'd just like to point out that due to the double L's in the spelling of Lloyd and Llewellyn, as well as the rhyme of Uri and Drury, it's possible this name Llewellyn Drury is a pseudonym, either to keep Lloyd's source anonymous or to hint that it was Lloyd himself who was visited by I am the man. So in short, Llewellyn Drury did not write at Adorpa, but was the one chosen to deliver it to the public by I am the man over 30 years before it was published by John Uri Lloyd. After materializing himself, much to the absolute horror and disbelief of Drury, I Am The Man dictated this story over many sessions with Drury, reading it from a large stack of yellowed papers that he brought with him. I Am The Man recounts his early days as a mortal, all the way up to his kidnapping and forced journey into Inner Earth, which eventually transformed him into this immortal state. He made Drury promise to hide the manuscript for 30 years illustrate it, and then finally publish it. And after this 30-year interval had passed, Llewellyn Drury reached out to his most well-connected friend, John Uri Lloyd, for assistance with publishing. At first, Lloyd was in disbelief, but he obsessed over the scientific nature of the manuscript, so he agreed to help. And together they hired the occult artist John Augustus Knapp to provide detailed illustrations just as I am the man instructed. Now, if Edadorpa was a genuine account of an inner earth journey that occurred in Kentucky in the early to mid 1800s, then there would be distinguishable connections to historical events and geographic locations to prove it. I am the man did not allow jury to give the names of any specific locations, but there are hints throughout as to where I am the man lived before his kidnapping. For example, it's written that, quote, In a section of the state in which I reside, a more traveled road stretches east to west, uniting the extremes of the major state. End quote. This could describe the geography of New York, with a major road stretching from the city of Buffalo all the way to Rochester. I Am The Man also describes a body of water called Seneca, which is the name of a real lake in northwest New York. That then leads us to the question, was I Am The Man a real person who went missing from Northwest New York? Let's take a step back and look at the story that led up to his kidnapping. I Am The Man was an average fellow who, later in his life, discovered a passion for esotericism and the occult. And after years of a growing passion and obsession with the occult sciences, I Am The Man was introduced to an unnamed brotherhood, a small group of students of hermetics and alchemy. It was not long after he joined the study group that I Am The Man received a very strange letter in the mail, which was addressed, quote, to the brother adept who dares try to discover Zoroaster's cave, or the philosopher's intellectual echoes, by means of which they communicate to one another from their caves, end quote. The entire letter is included in Edadorpa, and it describes the history of a powerful secret order. Apparently, this international fraternity dates back to truly ancient times, even before the days of the Egyptian alchemist Hermes Trismegistus, who I discussed previously in my videos, The Emerald Tablet and the Sleeping Prophet of Atlantis. This mysterious letter also came with a serious request. It asked whoever received it to follow their instructions to apply for membership in this shadowy group, swear to their pledges and oath of secrecy, then work their way up and learn the most hidden secrets of the order. The ultimate task, though, was to finally break the solemn vow and release these secrets to the public in order to enlighten mankind to the ancient knowledge 
that has been guarded for thousands of years by the elite. Quote, you must act what men will call the traitor, but humanity will be the gainer. End quote. Just from looking at the letter, I am the man could tell that it was quite old, and more than that, he was not the first person to receive it. It had actually been passed down by many scholars and hermetic students, both in Europe and America, as there were numerous markings and notes in the margins with dates spanning centuries. Every one of these people had, for obvious reasons, declined this incredibly dangerous task given to them, but I am the man was different. He felt like this was destined, and he would be the one to dare to do it. Hence the name that he is known as throughout the book, I am the man who did it. The story continues and I am the man becomes a member of this ancient fraternity by following the letter's directions to the dot, and over the years he works his way up through the group to learn their rituals, rites, and innermost secrets until finally he feels it is time to expose it all to the world. I am the man found a secluded location to begin writing his expose, and this was the beginning of his end. It was only shortly after he sent his manuscript to print that unlucky and suspicious events began to occur. First, he was thrown in jail for failing to pay a ridiculously small debt. And after he was bailed out, the printing office which had signed a contract to print his work was burned down. Finally, he was again arrested over a debt of only $2. This would be the last time I am the man would see his wife and child, as he was abducted from his jail cell and thrown into a horse-drawn carriage with covered windows. Alongside him and his abductors, who were masked men in robes, there was a corpse of a drowning victim that somewhat resembled him, that the abductors said would be used to cover up his kidnapping. The journey is long and winding, and because the windows are covered, I am the man has no way of knowing where he is. At night, the carriage stops and they take him and the corpse onto a boat, after which they dump the body into a river and guide I am the man to a secluded cabin in the woods. There they perform a strange ritual where an unknown liquid is applied to his skin and this liquid prematurely ages him, at least in appearance, into an old white-haired man who is completely unrecognizable from his former identity. After this transformation, their journey continues to his final destination, the cave of Zoroaster. There is an important connection to make here before I reveal the reality of this story. Although this ancient and powerful fraternity is never outright named in Edadorpa, the pledges I am the man gives closely resemble those in Freemasonry as well as many descriptions of their rites and mottos. The Freemasons are a real-life international secret order that officially dates back to at least the 13th century, and they still operate today in lodges spread across nearly every region of the US and Europe, and even parts of the Middle East. Their members include 14 presidents of the United States, such as George Washington, the Roosevelts, and Harry S. Truman the polymath Benjamin Franklin, the industrialist Henry Ford, as well as five monarchs of England and the Emperor of Russia, Peter the Great. The list goes on and certainly there are dozens of names anyone would recognize. Someday I'll do a special episode on the Freemasons, but for now, just know that there are strong and surprising ties to Freemasonry within this book at Adorpa. Specifically, I am the man was a real person, and his name was William Morgan. In August of 1826, William Morgan was abducted by Freemasons in Northwest New York and was never seen again, sparking one of the greatest revolts against Freemasons in history, including against the US president of the time, Andrew Jackson, who was a Freemason. So about William Morgan. William Morgan was a retired military captain of the War of 1812 and a father of two who lived in New York, working professionally as a stonecutter. At the time of his kidnapping, Morgan was also a master mason, 
which is the third and highest degree in Freemasonry. Beyond the three ancient degrees, many Masons proceed upward through further degrees, each one holding even greater secrets. And in 1825, William Morgan had achieved the most ultimate rank of Royal Arch Mason, described by the Freemasons as, quote, the root and marrow of Freemasonry, end quote. This same year, and for reasons unknown, William Morgan began working on an expose titled Illustrations of Masonry, which would reveal the innermost secrets of the Freemasons in detail. He signed a contract with three financial backers, entering a $500,000 penal bond to guarantee that it would be published. Even to this day, it makes very little sense why Morgan would do this as all Masons place their hand on a Bible and swear by their life to never reveal the rites, rituals, and passwords of the Freemasons. And thus, William Morgan was clearly risking his life doing this, and as a Master Mason, he would have known the consequences. The only explanation I can think of is either revenge, or that he was genuinely hoping to enlighten mankind to these secrets, as was the case with I am the man in Edadorpa. I am the man is, in fact, William Morgan. To begin, the details leading up to their abductions are almost identical. In 1826, Morgan was jailed over the non-payment of a minuscule loan, and after his printing partners and financial backers bailed him out, their newspaper office and print shop was mysteriously set on fire after which Morgan was thrown into jail once again, supposedly for failing to pay a $2 bill at a tavern. That night, William Morgan was abducted from his jail cell by a group of masked men in robes who escaped on a horse-drawn carriage, and he was never seen again. A year later, a bloated corpse washed up on the shores of Lake Ontario, and it was believed to be that of William Morgan, and even his wife thought so. However, not a single piece of clothing on the body belonged to Morgan. They belonged to another missing person who looked suspiciously similar, and his name was Timothy Monroe. If that wasn't enough, I Am The Man gives the exact date of his kidnapping as August 12, 1826, and historical records show that William Morgan also disappeared in August of 1826. Finally, the physical description of I am the man, given by Llewellyn Drury, seems to match one of the more standout features of William Morgan, which you may have noticed, and I quote, a forehead so vast, so high that it was almost a deformity, and yet it did not impress me unpleasantly. It was the forehead of a scholar, a profound thinker, a deep student, end quote. With all this, we can confidently say that the first ten chapters of Edadorpa are mostly a historical account of what happened to William Morgan. And I could keep going on with more evidence that connects the two, but I won't bore you with the minute details. If you're still with me, I simply want to ask, if there is outstanding evidence to suggest that the first ten chapters of Edadorpa are based on fact, just as the author and all those involved claim since the very beginning, then how should we interpret the rest of the book? Could the cave of Zoroaster exist and remain a sacred secret held by the Freemasons to this very day? Returning back to the story of Edadorpa, I Am The Man is taken by this horse-drawn carriage all the way down to Livingston County in Kentucky. There they travel deep into an unknown plain which is surrounded by several massive sinkholes. Finally, he and his captors exit the carriage and hike for approximately three days on foot, north of Cumberland River. And if you're wondering, yes, throughout the years, many people have searched this area in Kentucky, and there are indeed many caves there, some of which have never been officially explored. But back to I Am The Man's kidnapping. After their long three-day hike into a deep wooded valley, they come across a small but deep opening in the earth, next to a creek. Quote, the aperture was irregular in form, about the diameter of a well, 
and descending perpendicularly into the stony crust. I leaned over the orifice and heard the gurgle of water beneath." End quote. It is here, at the cave of Zoroaster, that the strange inner earth reptilian emerges, and I am the man is given to him. Together they travel into this subterranean world, and he would not see sunlight again for what he believed was several years, after which he was no longer a man, but a transcended immortal. The epilogue of the book is a letter written by I Am The Man, given to Llewellyn Drury who only opened it after the 30-year agreement had passed. The letter is ominous with its warnings of occult opposition, but again asserts that inner earth is the greatest truth unknown to most of mankind. It also gives Drury his final instructions, quote, Do not concern yourself about the reception of the work, for you are in no wise responsible for its statements. Those who grasp and appreciate, who can see the pertinence of its truths, who can read between the lines, will assuredly keep their knowledge of these facts locked in their own bosoms, or insidiously oppose them. The scientific enthusiasts, like the fraternity to which I belong, will obstruct the mind of the student either by criticism or ridicule, for many of these revelations are not recorded in his books. Revise the sentences, secure the services of an editor if you desire, and induce another to publish the book if you shrink from the responsibility. But in your revision, do not in any way alter the meaning of the statements made in the manuscript. Write the whole truth, for although mankind will not now accept as fact all that you and I have experienced, strange phases of life phenomena are revealing themselves, and humanity will yet surely be led to a higher plane. As men investigate the points of historical interest and the ultra-scientific phenomena broached in this narrative, evidence of the truths contained in these details will be disclosed. Finally, you must mutilate a page of the manuscript that you may select and preserve the fragment intact and in secret. Signed, I am the man. End quote. It remains unknown which page of the manuscript was mutilated by Drury as instructed, and we must hope that it wasn't one of the more important ones, especially since people continue to search for the cave of Zoroaster in Kentucky based off of geographic details given in the book. But the story of Edadorpa, both its contents and its context, and especially its connection to a real-life abduction ordered by the Freemasons, all of this makes Edadorpa one of the greatest inner earth conspiracies of all time. But stick with me here, because there is another case of an inner earth abduction that is downright bizarre. This next conspiracy blurs the lines between reality and madness, but perhaps nothing is rational when you dive down the rabbit hole. Hard science is hardly rational itself, rather, we accept what is repeatedly observed. So, what if you observed a subterranean world, as real as the screen you're watching me on, as real as the sound of my voice in your ears. Would you believe in inner earth? On the cover of a Pulp Fiction magazine from the 1940s, we are greeted by a strange caption, quote, The Shaver Mystery, the most sensational true story ever told, end quote. Inside his pages are action and sex-packed adventures within a deep underground network of caverns. Giant evil overlords loom in the distance, harboring hundreds of human captives. Our hero, armed with a ray gun and a super-fast flying machine, rides through endless tunnels. These stories tell of an ongoing war against an ancient race of evil inner-earth beings who have the ability to control events on the surface world using ground-penetrating rays and their righteous counterparts who seek to free the captive humans and end the influence of the evil ones forever. The story itself is fiction, as the editor tells readers at the very beginning. However, the world described is based on truth. The events are invented, but the setting is real. There truly is a subterranean realm ruled by ancient evil beings. The author, Richard Sharp Shaver, had seen it himself. 
In fact, he was held prisoner by them in inner earth for nearly eight years. This, my friends, is the Shaver mystery. Of course, this claim of truth by both the editor and author was extremely controversial in the scientific community. They presented their work as fiction, but with a strictly non-fiction premise. Richard Shaver asserted to the day that he died that for many years he was targeted by these inner earth beings and their ground penetrating ray machines, and that he was abducted and imprisoned by them until he was finally freed by their benevolent enemies, who also lived in inner earth. And when Shaver's story was released, it turned out that literally hundreds of others had experienced a similar abduction or contact with these beings and vouched for his story completely. Certainly, the Shaver mystery wouldn't be the first case of an inner earth story that was somewhat fictionalized but believed to have come from a true account. Both John Uri Lloyd's Edadorpa and Edward Bulwer Lytton's The Coming Race were strongly believed by occultists to fall into this category of fiction used as a vessel of the truth. And this is exactly how Richard Shaver's stories are presented, though they are far darker than most other accounts of Inner Earth. Was Shaver a man who experienced real trauma inflicted by real Inner Earth beings? Could he have been a con artist? Or were his writings simply the result of a serious mental illness? But perhaps we should begin by asking the most basic questions. Who was Richard Shaver, and why should we believe him? Shaver's story is about as strange as the pulp fiction he wrote. Not much can be verified about his early life, though we know that he was born in 1907, and by 1932, he was employed as a full-time welder at the Briggs Auto Body Plant in Detroit, and this was the period when he began to develop what seemed to be telepathic abilities with the help of his welding equipment. When his welding gun was turned on, it seemed to amplify a mysterious signal originating from underground. Now, Richard Shaver was both an atheist and skeptical of pretty much all paranormal phenomena. So, he thought that he might be losing it up there, and that's a genuine possibility. However, the sounds and signals projected into his head seemed to coincide with certain events happening on the surface, as if they could influence objects physically and even infiltrate the minds of people. For example, he could hear the voice from underground manipulating the thoughts of his co-workers, and he watched their behaviors shift accordingly. These strange events went on until some entity began transmitting warnings into Shaver's mind about a tragedy to come, and in February of 1934, that tragedy manifested in the sudden and agonizing death of his brother, Taylor Shaver, who Richard was incredibly close to. The cause of death was an extremely rare enlargement of the heart, but Richard Shaver felt strongly that an evil and powerful being from inner earth had targeted and killed his brother. Quote, The thing that killed him has followed me ever since. I talk to him many times every day. He has killed many people. Others are holding him in check. End quote. After this traumatic event, the telepathic transmissions from underground only intensified for Shaver, and his young wife, the up-and-coming artist Sophie Gervitz Shaver, had him sent to a mental institution where he would then be confined for two years. After all, he was displaying known symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia. However, he was never officially diagnosed, and the entire time he was being treated, Shaver remained convinced that he and his loved ones were being targeted by this inner earth being who had killed his brother. When Richard Shaver was released in December of 1936, that day he learned that his wife Sophie had died horrifically from a freak electrocution and their two-year-old daughter Evelyn had been hospitalized for scarlet fever and then taken away by his in-laws who told the girl that her father was dead. These tragic and traumatic events caused Shaver to quit his job and, according to Dr. Michael Barkin, 
who performed significant research into the Shaver mystery. Barkin notes that Shaver seems to have disappeared from the face of the earth from the end of 1936 until 1943. According to Richard Shaver, these eight years were spent as a captive of Inner Earth, where he was abducted, tortured, and finally escaped alive and knowing he wasn't crazy. However, the surface world would never believe his crazy true story. And after his escape, he lived mostly as a hobo, until he gathered the courage to reach out to the one publication that might get his story out there. The Pulp Fiction Magazine, Amazing Stories. In 1943, Richard Shaver wrote a letter to the editor of Amazing Stories, Ray Palmer. In it, he described a proto-human language which he called Mantung, which was so ancient that it was likely the root of all other languages in human history, much like the Vitanian language I briefly explored in my video on Agartha. Mantung is quite unique though. In this language, every sound has a hidden meaning, which meant that the linguistic formulas given by Shaver could be applied to any word in any language in order to decode a secret meaning in Mantung. For example, with the English alphabet, the sound of the letter A represents the concept animal, and the sound of the letter B communicates a state of being or to be, and the letter C means see, just like with your eyeballs. But perhaps the two most important letters and sounds are that of D and T. D represents the concept of detrimental and all things negative, and the opposite of this is T, which represents integration and all things positive. We'll get back to these two letters, D and T, in a bit. Shaver explained to the editor, Ray Palmer, that prehistoric root meanings could be found in all words simply by applying the Mantong formula. For example, the word bad has the sounds of B, A, and D, and thus bad means to be animalistic and detrimental. As strange as it sounds, Ray Palmer tested the Mantong formula with several words and was pretty surprised by the accuracy of the results, which he stated were logical and sensible 90% of the time, certainly higher than pure chance. So he went on to publish Shaver's Mantong Alphabet in the January 1944 issue of Amazing Stories, and asked his readers to try it out for themselves and submit their findings. If you'd like to try Mantong, you can pause the video here and see the entire Mantong Alphabet, along with a number of example words and definitions. Meanwhile, Palmer couldn't knock the feeling that there was more that Shaver was holding back, so he began a lengthy exchange of letters between them, first asking how Shaver discovered Mantong. He received back a 10,000 word document with the title, A Warning to Future Man. In it, Richard Shaver revealed the 12,000 year secret history of Earth and the reality of an extensive network of inhabited caverns that altogether is far larger than the land on the surface. The story begins thousands of years before historic record. Below the early civilizations of humanity, Inner Earth was inhabited by powerful aliens which Shaver dubbed the Elder Race. These beings were sensitive to the radiation produced by the sun, so they lived in massive caverns beneath the Earth's surface to protect themselves. However, approximately 12,000 years ago, the solar poisoning had grown too intense and the Elder Race was forced to abandon Earth entirely. But their caverns were not left empty. These aliens left behind two types of beings. The first were the Darrow, short for Detrimental Robots, who were former humans that were mutated and driven insane by the Elder Race's abandoned technology. I'll elaborate on the Darrow a bit later. The second group were the Taro, short for Integrative Robots, who were benevolent and sane members of the Elder Race. However, physically they had been horribly mutated by the sun and were thus abandoned. Though Shaver called both the Darrow and Taro robots, he was simply describing the predictable natures of these two groups. One was always evil, 
and the other was always good. Both of these groups, the Darrow and the Taro, had access to specialized ray technology left behind by the Elder Race. These ray machines included needle rays that caused pain, stim rays that caused pleasure, ben rays that could heal and even resurrect, telog rays that were used to transmit voices into the minds of living beings, such as Shaver himself, and finally, epilepto rays, which would cause seizures. The Darrow abused these ancient machines in order to torture people in the surface world with pain and insanity, and conversely the Taro used it to send warnings to those on the surface world, as well as fight against the Darrow and prevent them from destroying Earth entirely. Taking a closer look at the Darrow, it seems that they fit the definition of what has been described for thousands of years as devils or demons, and if you watched my previous video on demonology, we know that demons were commonly blamed for invisible tortures on the surface world and could easily cause disasters, unexplainable events, possessions, and insanity by targeting people and projecting intrusive and terrible thoughts into their minds. Unlike demons, however, the Darrow have a literal bloodlust for humans and frequently kidnap people on the surface for meat or simply torture. Disturbingly, the Darrow were apparently former humans, as I mentioned before, and Richard Shaver provided their origin story. Quote, Long ago it happened that certain underground cities were abandoned and into these cities stole many wild mortals to live. Due to their improper handling of the life force and ray apparatus in the abandoned cities, these apparatus became harmful in effect. These ignorant people learned to play with these things, but not to renew them. So gradually they were mentally impregnated with the persistently disintegrative particles. These wild people, living in the same rooms with degenerating force generators, in time became Darrow, which is short for Detrimental Energy Robot. When this process has gone on long enough, a race of Darrow is produced, whose Every thought movement is concluded with the decision to kill." End quote. Richard Shaver was truly afraid of these beings. He believed that the Tarot had warned him in 1934 and 1936 respectively of the impending deaths of his brother Taylor and later his wife Sophie, and that these were not mere deaths but, in fact, targeted executions by the Darrow, which led up to his eventual eight-year abduction and imprisonment in their caves. Now, to be 100% clear, these descriptions of Inner Earth and the Darrow Conspiracy could have been the result of Shaver's mental illness to explain the unthinkable tragedies that he went through, and I'm not saying that they aren't. Mental illness is absolutely a real thing. In fact, the psychoanalyst Victor Tosk published a paper in 1919 called The Origin of the Influencing Machine in Schizophrenia, which describes almost the exact symptoms Richard Shaver was showing. But the fact is that the Shaver mystery was presented as factual, and thousands of readers believed it to be true, and many even vouched for it from their own experience. Thus we must continue our investigation of this conspiracy theory to the end, as there is much more to the story. Returning back to this 10,000 word document, a warning to future man, Ray Palmer was utterly fascinated by Shaver's secret history of the Earth. Palmer may have been the lead editor of a science fiction magazine, but he himself was an open-minded man and a bit of an occultist, and related many of his own experiences with the occult to Shaver's explanation of the Darrow and Tarot. In short, Palmer believed that Shaver may have actually experienced what he described, at least a little bit. Shaver's authenticity spoke to his heart. Unlike any con man, Shaver displayed vulnerability in what he was writing, knowing that it sounded crazy, even closing his initial letter with, quote, I need a little encouragement, end quote. With great encouragement, Ray Palmer lifted up this beaten and broken vagrant, into one of his highest paid writers, and took his manuscript A Warning to Future Man with its 
vague plot, weak prose, and almost non-existent characters, and transformed it into a 31,000 word novella entitled I Remember Lemuria. Palmer insisted to both Shaver and the public at large that he did not alter any core elements of Shaver's original document, but only added an exciting plot so it wouldn't be so incredibly dull. Finally, he published I Remember Lemuria in the March 1945 issue of Amazing Stories, hyping it up with an announcement that reminds me of John Uri Lloyd's letter to the physics professor. Palmer boasted, quote, for the first time in its history, Amazing Stories is preparing to present a true story, but it's a story that you won't find in the newspapers. We, the editors, believe the story. We may bring down a hurricane of debate, and perhaps even scorn on our heads, but let it come." End quote. And the issue sold out almost immediately. I remember Lemuria was a massive success. At first, Shaver was angry at Palmer for the changes he made. Quote, the whole slant of everything I had to say was switched from the factual to the misty umbrella of spiritualism and reincarnation. Utter hawkum to me. End quote. Shaver was both an atheist and an absolute materialist, and despite having experienced telepathy, he had no belief in any spiritualism. He was absolutely insistent on a literal interpretation of his experiences. Plain and simple, Inner Earth and the Darrow existed physically, in caverns below our feet. There was no layered or occult meaning to it. The public were a bit more enthusiastic than Shaver though, and thanks to this massive interest, Palmer and Shaver went on to work together for several years, detailing out the lore of this Inner Earth world. From 1945 to 1949, over two dozen Shaver stories were published, some of them long enough to be novels, and most of them making the cover of the magazine. And in response, literally tens of thousands of letters were written to amazing stories about the Shaver mystery. Even crazier is that hundreds of these people claim to have ventured into caves and encountered the Darrow, Tarot, or the Elder Race's abandoned technology and some had even been abducted by the Darrow and held prisoner in Inner Earth, just like Richard Shaver. One letter wrote, quote, For heaven's sake, drop the whole thing. You are playing with dynamite. My companion and I fought our way out of a cave with a submachine gun. My friend has a hole the size of a dime in his right biceps. It was scarred inside. How, we don't know but we believe we know more about the Shaver mystery than any other pair." End quote. Another letter was from a woman in Paris who claimed to have been taken in a secret elevator deep underground where she was then imprisoned and tortured by the Darrow for many months, until a benevolent terror broke in and freed her, leading her back to the surface. Amazing Stories also published a letter from a woman named Margaret Rogers who claimed that in 1930, she was suffering from a heroin addiction in Mexico City, and was abducted and taken into a deep cave. There she found herself in the care of an advanced race of 10-foot-tall inner earth beings who called themselves the Nephli, though they seemingly matched Shaver's description of the tarot. These cave dwellers used their technology to cure Roger's drug addiction, and she proceeded to live with them for the next three years. During this time, she learned that the cave system was also inhabited by a hostile colony called the Janza, which is presumably another name for the Darrow. Yet another case revolved around a Darrow victim named Steve Brody. In 1938, Brody was apparently approached by two large hooded figures who forcefully placed small devices behind his ears before rendering him unconscious. Brody would later wake up in a dark cave along with several other men, and they were held prisoner by the Darrow for an unspecified amount of time. One day, after a blackout, Brody found himself back in New York City with no idea how he had escaped, nor the fates of the other men. There were literally hundreds of these types of letters, of people confirming that the Darrow, 
Tarot and Shaver's account of Inner Earth was accurate. Whether each of these people were mentally ill, or it was some sort of mass hysteria, there's really no way to know. We only know that these people claimed it was real. The Shaver mystery was a commercial success for sure, and new stories from Shaver and Palmer ran in Amazing Stories for years, under titles such as Invasion of the Micromen, Merwitch of Ether 18, Ziggor Mephisto's Collection of Mentalia, and Of Gods and Goats. The entire time, the lore that the Shaver mystery was fiction based on truth continued to be aggressively promoted, and this resulted in a harsh backlash from the small but vocal science fiction fandom against both Richard Shaver and Ray Palmer. They denounced, insulted, and started hate campaigns against both of them. Shaver would write that, quote, all this active fan opposition hurts like hell, end quote. Finally, in 1948, the upper management of Amazing Stories banned Richard Shaver from the magazine completely, which not only ended his career but crushed his spirit. At the same time, Ray Palmer claimed publicly that sinister outside forces had silenced the magazine, and he quit his job as chief editor out of solidarity for his dear friend. Palmer would remain close friends with Shaver until Shaver's death in 1975 and until the end, they both maintained the truth in their stories. Incredibly, though the Shaver mystery was entirely based on eyewitness testimony, there may be some physical evidence of the Elder Race who once inhabited the bowels of Earth, if you're willing to entertain one final Shaver mystery. In the mid-1960s, Richard Shaver moved to Summit, Arkansas with his third wife Dottie, and spent the final decades of his life searching for physical evidence of these ancient extraterrestrials. And he found this in a very bizarre set of rocks that he believed were not actually rocks, but in fact ancient books created by the Elder Race before they abandoned Earth. According to Shaver, these rocks were embedded with legible text, and even pictures, archived inside the stone through the use of a special laser technology. Shaver called these rock books, and for many years he devoted himself to studying them. He wrote extensively about his findings, photographed the rock books at different angles, and made detailed paintings of the images he saw in them. Shaver even went as far as to create a rock book lending library through the mail, where he would send a polished slice of the rock book to the borrower, alongside a detailed description of what text and images were archived within the stone. For the final decade of his life, he attempted to interpret these prehistoric texts and communicate his findings with the public, but he never achieved even a fraction of the recognition and interest as he had with the Shaver mystery. And today, Richard Shaver is mostly remembered as an outside artist, a man whose grand imagination was fueled entirely by an undiagnosed case of paranoid schizophrenia. Shaver's final works with the rock books would be included in Ray Palmer's memoir, The Secret World, which was published just a few short months before the elderly Richard Shaver passed away in November 1975. And just two years later, in 1977, Palmer would pass away too. Together, they had created an entire mythos of Inner Earth, and whether true or delusional, the Shaver mystery of the 1940s had an enormous influence on the eventual rise of UFO culture and extraterrestrial lore. For example, the Caves of the Darrow would later return as subterranean alien bases, ripe for human experimentation. And a division of the Elder Race, known as Nor, were supposed to be tall, blonde interstellar demigods, and this likely led to the idea of Nordic aliens. However, this can also be explained the other way around, that Nordic aliens were indeed part of the Elder Race, and that the Darrow continued to terrorize humans in their high-tech underground bases, and these reports of Darrow abduction and experimentation persist today, just without the Darrow name attached. So we must wonder. Was Richard Shaver mentally ill? 
Or might he have experienced something so unbelievable that the world can't help but call him crazy? The Shaver mystery blurred the lines between fiction, reality, and psychosis, and without a doubt, it remains a haunting tale in the world of inner earth conspiracies. Edadorpa and the Shaver mystery were quite the trip, wouldn't you agree? And I'm so glad to have you all with me for the ride. I've got way more inner earth coming with mind-boggling stories and unsolved mysteries about the secret history of the world. But for now, if you haven't checked out my first inner earth conspiracies video, definitely cue that one up. Otherwise, I highly recommend my video, The Sleeping Prophet of Atlantis, for more channeled inner earth lore, this time beneath Egypt. Or if you're watching in the distant future, Inner Earth Conspiracies Part 3. Thank you so much to my patrons for making what I do possible. And if you want to support too, there are links in the description. And you can also show love by sharing this series with a friend. I'm Mr. Mythos. You guys are awesome. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.